Introduction to Pediatric Stroke Management by Mia Bernson Lung. Hello, my name is Mia Bernson Lung from the Boston Children's Hospital Stroke and Cerebrovascular Center. Today, I will be speaking about pediatric stroke. Incidence of stroke. Stroke is unfortunately common among serious pediatric neurologic problems. About 1 in 1,600 to 1 in 4,000 neonates will have a stroke around the time of birth, defined as between the 20th week of gestation and the 28th postnatal day. In older children, one month of age to 18 years, the annual incidence of stroke is between 2.3 and 4.6 per 100,000 children per year. This means that at least 1,000 neonates and 1,600 children will have a stroke in the United States this year. Of note, we will not talk about neonatal stroke for the remainder of this video, as the risk factors and treatments for neonatal stroke and stroke in older children are completely different. Classification Stroke can be divided into ischemic and hemorrhagic, and in children, about half of strokes are ischemic and half are hemorrhagic. An ischemic stroke occurs when brain tissue is damaged due to the blockage of an artery or vein. An arterial ischemic stroke, or AIS, is caused by the loss of downstream blood supply when an artery is occluded. This can be resulting from areas of vessel lumen narrowing or endothelial injury, an increase in clot formation, what we call hypercoagulability, or thromboembolism, when a clot formed elsewhere in the body, such as in the heart, moves and becomes lodged in a cerebral artery. Ischemic stroke resulting from the blockage of a vein is called venous infarction. The loss of venous drainage leads to pressure buildup and therefore tissue damage. This is one possible result of a cerebral sinovenous thrombosis, or CSVT, when a clot forms within the draining sinuses of the brain. Symptoms of each type of stroke will be discussed at a later point in the video. Transient ischemic attack, or TIA, is defined as the symptoms of an ischemic stroke that resolve. In adults, this has been defined as symptom resolution within 24 hours without ischemic injury being apparent on imaging. And we now know that TIA can also occur in children. TIA is important because it often heralds a future stroke, and therefore a complete workup is warranted. Hemorrhagic strokes occur when there is tissue damage due to bleeding within the brain, an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, or adjacent to the surface of the brain, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This produces mass effect and ischemia of the adjacent tissues. Risk factors. A number of risk factors have been identified for arterial ischemic stroke in children, and often these are quite different from those for adults. Many of these are also risk factors for CSVT. It's important to identify these risk factors because many of them may be of value for prognosis or may necessitate a targeted therapy. The major category at 53% of arterial ischemic strokes in children is arteriopathy, a congenital or acquired abnormality of the cerebral blood vessels. Examples include dissection, vasculitis, the arteriopathy associated with sickle cell disease, moya moya, and focal cerebral arteriopathy, a unique phenomenon in children that may have an infectious trigger. The second major category of risk factors for arterial ischemic stroke in children is cardiac disease. This includes congenital heart disease, particularly cyanotic lesions, and acquired heart disease, such as endocarditis or cardiomyopathy. Children with cardiac disease are at particular risk of stroke around the time of procedures, such as surgeries or cardiac catheterizations, or when requiring mechanical circulatory support, such as with an ECMO or VAD device. The next category at 23% of arterial ischemic strokes is acute head and neck conditions, including head trauma, intracranial surgery, meningitis, and pharyngitis. Following that at 22% of arterial ischemic strokes is acute systemic conditions, including sepsis and shock. A number of chronic systemic conditions are seen in about 19% of children with arterial ischemic stroke, and these include sickle cell disease, other genetic disorders such as connective tissue disorders, systemic malignancies, indwelling catheters, and the use of oral contraceptives. Similarly, a prothrombotic state is found in about 13% of children with ischemic stroke, including genetic or acquired thrombophilias or hypercoagulable states. Importantly, atherosclerosis, which is a major contributor to stroke burden in adults, is seen in only 2% of children with stroke. 
all told about 24% of children with stroke will have some sort of infection around the time of presentation. And oftentimes this can serve as the acute trigger for stroke in a child who has an underlying predisposition. In fact, about 50% of children with arterial ischemic stroke will be found to have two or more risk factors, and therefore it's important to keep looking even after a single risk factor has been identified. All told, 90% of children will have one or more risk factors, leaving only 10% unexplained. Factors associated with hemorrhagic stroke in children include vascular anomalies, such as arteriovenous malformation, aneurysm, and cavernous malformation. Vasculopathies, such as those associated with sickle cell disease or Moya Moya syndrome due to the fragility of those blood vessels. Coagulation disorders, such as hemophilia, vitamin K deficiency, or anticoagulant therapy. And this is one reason that children with cardiac disease may be at risk for both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke if they are using anticoagulants. And finally, brain tumors. Hemorrhage can also occur secondary to CSVT due to the buildup of venous pressure. And finally, an ischemic stroke can undergo hemorrhagic transformation. Similar to ischemic stroke in children, about 90% of children with hemorrhagic stroke will have at least one identifiable risk factor. Clinical presentation. The presentation of acute ischemic stroke in children can be similar to that of adults. The hallmark is the acute onset of a focal neurologic deficit. About 85% of children with arterial ischemic stroke will have focal signs, including hemiparesis in 60 to 80%, a speech difficulty in 10 to 35%, or visual field defects in 5 to 20%. Focal symptoms of ischemic stroke may be localizable to specific areas of brain tissue that correspond to the vascular territory of the occluded vessel. I'll highlight a number of these vascular syndromes, but it's important to recognize that children may not manifest all of the symptoms of a given vascular syndrome, and that other combinations of symptoms may be possible depending on the territory affected. Strokes affecting the anterior cerebral artery often involve weakness of the contralateral leg and may also have behavior changes. Strokes of the middle cerebral artery can manifest as weakness of the contralateral face and arm, a speech disturbance such as aphasia or dysarthria, a visual field deficit or hemianopia, inattention to stimuli on one half of the body or in one half of space called hemineglect, and sensory deficits. Stroke in the posterior cerebral artery territory can also produce visual field deficits and sensory deficits. Strokes in the vertebra basilar system can be harder to identify because they often don't manifest with lateralized signs. For instance, symptoms of vertebra basilar stroke can include dizziness, ataxia, impaired balance, abnormalities of eye movements or pupils, changes in speech or swallowing, and weakness in sensory, sensory changes in various patterns, as well as a decrease in the level of consciousness. Finally, occlusions of the cerebral veins and sinuses, such as CSVT, can produce decreased level of consciousness, headache, vomiting, and papilledema, particularly as a late sign. Children with ischemic strokes can also present with diffuse signs, making recognition that a stroke has occurred challenging. About 61 to 64 percent of children with arterial ischemic strokes will have diffuse signs, such as altered mental status in 42 to 52 percent, or headache in 24 to 40 percent. And in fact, about 10 percent of children with stroke may have only diffuse signs. Similarly, about 33 to 49 percent of children with an arterial stroke will have both focal signs and diffuse signs that are not referable to a specific vascular territory. There's an important relationship between stroke and seizures for children. About 25 to 31 percent of children with an arterial ischemic stroke will have a seizure around the time of presentation, and as many as 42 percent of younger children will have a seizure. This is in comparison to only 5 percent of adults having a seizure at the time of their stroke. Oftentimes, the acute onset of focal deficits is attributed to a post-ictal or TODS paralysis, but it's important to recognize that the incidence of a new onset focal epilepsy presenting with a TODS paralysis is about comparable to that of a new stroke. And so it's important to consider stroke for all first-time focal seizures, regardless of the presence of paralysis. About 37% of hemorrhagic strokes will have acute seizures, and 20 to 48% of CSVT will have acute seizures. Prognosis. The prognosis of stroke in children is unfortunately mixed. 
the immediate mortality is between 10 and 40 percent, making cerebrovascular disorders among the top 10 causes of child mortality. Only 37 percent of children who have an ischemic stroke will make a full recovery, and 41 percent of children with arterial ischemic stroke or CSVT will have moderate to severe deficits. The recurrence risk of arterial stroke within five years ranges between 7 and 41 percent, depending on the etiology and the population studied. For example, perinatal strokes have only a 1 to 2 percent recurrence rate, whereas strokes associated with arteriopathy have a 66 percent recurrence rate within five years. And finally, regardless of the presence of seizure at the time of acute stroke, more than 25 percent of children with stroke will go on to have epilepsy. Differential Diagnosis There's a broad list of differential diagnoses for the acute onset of neurologic deficits in children, but many of them, like stroke, are serious and warrant rapid recognition. The list of differential diagnoses for stroke in children includes complicated migraine, seizure or postictal symptoms not due to stroke, hemorrhage, such as traumatic hemorrhage or a hemorrhagic stroke being on the differential for an ischemic stroke, Intracranial infection, such as meningitis or abscess, trauma, tumor, demyelinating diseases, such as multiple sclerosis or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or PRESS, toxic exposures, metabolic derangements, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, formerly known as pseudotumor cerebri, post infectious processes, such as cerebellitis or acute cerebellar ataxia musculoskeletal causes of weakness, and finally, somatoform disorders. The literature has consistently demonstrated significant delays in the diagnosis of pediatric stroke. The delay from symptom onset to diagnosis in children with arterial ischemic stroke has consistently been shown to be greater than 24 hours. While some of this may be attributable to a lack of recognition by the lay public that stroke can happen to children, diagnoses are delayed even in strokes that occur in hospital. This highlights the need to establish pathways of rapid triage and definitive diagnosis for pediatric stroke. These pathways are often referred to as stroke stat, code stroke, or hyperacute stroke protocols, and are based on models from the adult stroke world. In general, the goal is for the time of presentation to the hospital, to diagnosis, to institution of targeted therapies, the so-called door-to-needle time, as being under 60 minutes. The rationale for having hyperacute stroke protocol for children is that time is brain. For every minute of brain ischemia, 1.9 million neurons are lost, 14 billion synapses are lost, and 7.5 miles of myelinated fibers are lost. Some children, those who present within a narrow time window and don't have other contraindications, may be candidates for acute reperfusion therapy with tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, or mechanical thrombectomy an endovascular approach with stent retrievers or other devices. However, even patients who are not candidates for these acute reperfusion therapies will benefit from the rapid institution of therapies that aim to maximize the supply and minimize demand to the area of ischemic brain, as well as rapid attention to preventing or managing complications should they arise, such as seizures or aspiration. Imaging pathways have been developed for the rapid diagnosis of hyperacute stroke in children, and the preferred modality is magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. The reason for this is that an MRI can demonstrate an area of ischemic injury within minutes after it has begun, and thereby allow a patient to be a candidate for an acute reperfusion therapy. The sequences that should be considered include a diffusion-weighted image, which will show the development of ischemia, and a susceptibility-weighted image, which will rule out hemorrhage without the need for an additional CT scan. Other sequences that are important are the flare or T2 sequence to look for edema, and if possible, perfusion-weighted imaging to assess regional blood flow. It's very important to do an angiogram of the head and the neck to assess for areas of vessel occlusion and vascular abnormalities. With magnetic resonance imaging, this can be performed as a time of flight, MRA, which is a non-contrast study. And it's very important to include the neck as well as the head in order to assess the entire course of the cervicocephalic vessels. The alternative imaging pathway is based on computed tomography, CT, 
but it's important to recognize that CT done early after the onset of stroke will not demonstrate any abnormalities and so cannot be used to prove that there is ischemic injury that has occurred. A non-contrast head CT will rule out the presence of hemorrhage, but again, will not show any signs of ischemia early in the course. CT angiography can also be used to assess for vessel occlusions or vascular abnormalities, and again, this should involve the head and the neck. A CTA or CT angiogram is a contrast study. Here we demonstrate some of the imaging findings of an acute arterial ischemic stroke. The first image is diffusion-weighted imaging, specifically the trace sequence, and you can see a large area of bright signal corresponding to an acute stroke in the left middle cerebral artery territory. The magnetic resonance angiogram shows the area where the left middle cerebral artery should be is not a pacifying and therefore is likely to be occluded, corresponding to the area of left middle cerebral artery stroke that we saw on the diffusion-weighted imaging. Treatment. In terms of acute stroke treatments, for arterial ischemic strokes with a demonstrated vascular occlusion, intravenous TPA and intraarterial therapy, such as endovascular stent retrieval, has been performed in research settings and on a case-by-case -case basis. For all children with arterial ischemic stroke, secondary stroke prevention should be initiated with either aspirin 3 to 5 milligrams per kilogram once per day for a maximum of 81 milligrams, or with therapeutic anticoagulation with a heparin drip or injection of a low molecular weight heparin, depending on the etiology or while the evaluation of stroke etiology is ongoing. For children with stroke due to sickle cell disease, an emergent exchange transfusion is indicated to reduce the fraction of sickle hemoglobin. For CSVT, anticoagulation is generally warranted, even in some cases if hemorrhage is already present, in order to prevent further propagation of the thrombus. All children with stroke will benefit from neuroprotective and supportive care measures to maximize perfusion to the area of ischemic brain tissue. This always starts with the ABCs, maximizing oxygenation and perfusion. The head of the bed should be laid flat to increase forward flow to the area of ischemic brain. Perfusion can be supported with isotonic fluids running at maintenance with consideration of an additional bolus. Our blood pressure targets are usually greater than the 50th percentile for the patient's age and height. Fever and seizures, should they arise, should be treated aggressively to minimize metabolic demand on the already ischemic brain. Sodium and glucose should be normalized. And in cases in which severe edema develops, such as the malignant MCA syndrome, hyperosmolar therapy and decompressive hemicraniectomy may be indicated. In summary, stroke in children is not rare and has significant mortality and morbidity. The rapid recognition and diagnosis of pediatric stroke can enable the delivery of time-sensitive therapies and can minimize complications. And finally, ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke and cerebral synovenous thrombosis have many causes in children and a detailed evaluation is warranted. Thank you for watching. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.